All right, everyone, we'd like to welcome to the program Fox Sports lead college football analyst and a reporter for Fox's USGA Championship coverage, Joel Klatt. Thanks for joining, man. Yes, you bet. It's good to be here. Well, we appreciate you joining. And uh, before we jump into the heavy hitters, how about you tell us a little about that first ever hole-in-one, which came just a couple weeks ago. That's just a golfer's dream, isn't it? Man, you ain't lying. I thought, and you know what? I, <laughs> I thought it would never happen. Like, I've been playing for a long time, never had one, been close several times, but I just resigned myself to the fact, like, I was going to be one of those guys that never had one, and, and everyone would make fun of me on every single part three. You know, I'm in all the lifetime bets. I'm sure you have them as well with friends, like, okay, dollar a yard. If we ever make a hole in one, it's a dollar a yard. And I've paid out on a couple of them, and I was like, I'm just going to lose money my whole life on this because I'm never going to get one. And last week, boy, oh, it felt so good. I think the best part was I was asked immediately by some of my buddies who were not with me. They were like, hey, well, was it a good shot or a good bounce? And and thankfully, it was a really good shot. Pitched about a yard from the hole and, and spun back a little bit and just kind of slowly dropped into the hole. And it was going slow enough, even with our little, you know, like uh, foam in the hole, that it dropped into the hole because ours is under the cup, so it goes into the hole. But if it's going too fast, it'll bounce out, but it stayed in. So even I got a coronavirus hole in one, but it was legitimate. That's awesome to hear. And, I, you know, I was thinking the same thing. A lot of those foam inserts, like I've seen putts drop in and pop out. So how many hole-in-ones are just getting robbed these days? Right. right. And how about the ones that are above the hole, right? Like you just have to ram it into the foam or, or something like that. And I'm like, yeah. I've heard people say like, oh, I had a shot from 150 that hit the foam. I'm like, well, good birdie. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, congrats again. That's, uh, that's Thanks, an awesome story. So you have such an incredible athletic background. You're a record-setting quarterback at the University of Colorado, a high school baseball standout who was drafted by the San Diego Padres, and then finally, and most importantly, an, S- an active SPGA member with a very crisp plus-two handicap these days. So, Ooh. How, yeah. Yeah. Well, you caught me at my lowest ever, too, right? It's not very like... dangerous. So how would, how would you rank your passion for those three? You're obviously outstanding in, in all three of them. Uh, well, listen, I mean, I do not miss getting hit, right, playing football. I love football. My dad was a high school football coach, and so I would always say that football is my passion. I love college football. I, I don't think I can overstate my love for the game of college football. And yet, you know, like, what I get to actively do is, is golf. And so I just love it as my competitive outlet. Uh, I love everything about it. I love the gear. I love watching it. And I would definitely sell to say it's kind of taken over as as my my first love of what I get to actively do. So I'd have I have to say golf. Although I got to tell you, as as nice as it is to say like yeah, you know I'm a plus two, it is impossible to win bets. Just impossible. Dude, I I feel your pain so much. I'm uh, I'm at my lowest right now, and all my buddies just pay their mortgage off of me. Yes. So what, so what are you right now? I'm a two and a half. Um, See, and, you know, I play, I play with probably two of the people that I play with the most are in the double digits. So it's just, Oh, I those get, guys I get, are the worst. I get raked those over. Those guys are the worst. Well, he had a, one of them, he's a 12. He had a hole in one the other day and I'm pretty sure he was popping on the par three. So come on. One for zero net zero right in my face. So yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. You know, you know. So uh, I play out of Shady Canyon down here, and in, in, um, it's in Irvine, California. And there's several former professional football, or I'm sorry, professional baseball players, a couple of them, and awesome guys, and I love playing with them. But I gave one of them 17 shots the other day. I'm like, what in God? You are a professional. What is happening right now? Needless to say, I lost money. Yeah. Yeah, prayer, prayers up to you. So, 17! That's a like, lot. What are, what are we doing? That's a lot. That's a lot. If he listens to this, he's going to know who he is. <laughs> All right. You've, you've been warned, player X. Uh, <laughs> so around this time last year, you made your debut on uh, the Fox Sports set as a post-round reporter at the U.S. Women's Open and the U.S. Open. 
Um, what were your takeaways from that experience and maybe some of the challenges that you didn't expect going in? Yeah, I mean, I was I was nervous, candidly. Um, just because, you know, I had done a lot of things on television. I've posted on the desk before. I'm obviously in the booth as, as a color commentator. You know, I, I did sidelines early in my career. But rarely have I been in a position where I'm the one asking the questions. And, you know, thankfully, in, in the last few years, I've done a few of those trophy presentations for, like, the, the Big Ten championship game, uh, some of the bowl games that we've done. And and I got to say, it I thought it prepared me well because those are, are spur of the moment, in, in the heat of the action, kind of heat of the moment type of interviews where – you really have to just react. Um, I was trying to be as prepared as I possibly could, but but it became very apparent to me that the best stuff that was going to come from those interviews wasn't going to be some you know uh, prepared nugget that I had from the players' previous three tournaments or three U.S. Open championships, so on and so forth. It was going to be something that happened during that round and impacted him. Uh, in particular in that men's open or her in the women's open. And so, you know, to me, there was two, two things that I really tried to focus on. That was watching the broadcast intently to see what our guys were saying about these players and when those turns of event, uh, of events happened in their rounds. And then once I got them in the tent, it was really about listening. And I thought that that was maybe the biggest eye opener to me. And I, and you know, I asked some guys that I trusted before the the championship, and they said the same thing. They said, "Listen, the best thing you can do is listen," and that was absolutely true. Um, and then the last thing I would say is is I was fortunate that when the guys came in, in particular in that men's open, when the guys came in. Um, and I had not met a lot of them. You know, I had tried earlier that week and in previous U.S. Open, so I had maybe met in passing some of these guys. And yet I had this background in college football, which they're all fans of. So we immediately started talking about college football off camera. And that put me at an incredible ease because all of a sudden they were asking me about my wheelhouse. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> we're good. Um, talked with Ricky Fowler about Oklahoma State, Zach Johnson about Iowa, Brooks Kepka, and I talked about Florida State. Those, those are things that just put me at ease and I think made the interviews go much smoother. And I think it made those guys more comfortable with me uh, in that setting. So um, that's kind of how it went for me. Um, I, and I got to tell you, it was – I loved it. I loved every single moment of it. And I can't wait to get back and we'll see how it all plays out depending on um, what my schedule is like in the fall. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of critics in the industry have really applauded the Fox Sports coverage. It's come a long way. I mean, there was no secret that there were a few skeptics when you initially won those rights, but I think the perspective has certainly changed. What would you say, what should golf fans continue to expect from Fox Sports in the future? Yeah, I think that you can expect what you've come to expect, and that is – I don't think that there's any, any of us that would say we came out of the gate at Chambers Bay firing on all cylinders, and yet we were a, a group that internally focused on what we could get better at, what could make the, the sport better, the experience for the fans at home better, um, and, and we tried to implement that. And so Mark Loomis, our, our producer, has done a fabulous job of constantly – uh, watching and, and searching for ways to get better and cleaner and make the golf shine versus trying to force ourselves into the action. And, and I think that you can expect that because I think every single year our group has gotten better and better and better to the point where last year, like you said, for the, maybe the first time in, in golf's, uh, in Fox's golf uh, history, we were um, roundly applauded for the coverage at Pebble Beach. And I know, you know, watching an open at Pebble has something to do with that. So I'm, I'm not blind to that either. And then the next thing I would say is you can continue to expect us to push the envelope as it relates to technology. And I think that's the most important part, to be honest. Uh, think about what Fox has done for golf in the last four years. When we at Chambers Bay put shot tracers all over the course, every tee box, followed them into the fairway with shot tracers, more graphics as it relates to yardage, 
the microphones closer to the player caddy conversation, that was a novelty in golf. You know, people had not seen that uh, for the better part of, of golf coverage in the past. And now it's become the expectation. And even the establishment broadcasts, which do a tremendous job, have had to adopt a lot of those technology innovations that Fox brought to the forefront. And I think all of us are incredibly proud, and our technology department is incredibly proud of the way that we have covered the game and really changed the way that the game is covered on a, on a broad spectrum, because that's what golf fans expect. When you turn on uh, the golf to watch Colonial this weekend, that's what you'll expect is shot tracers and technology to help you view and experience the shots in real time. Yeah, 100%. And just as a casual golf fan speaking here, I think um... – you know, having the shot tracer on every single shot isn't that hard to do. And I think Fox has proven that through the years at the U.S. Open coverage that you guys really just set the bar for that viewer experience. And I'm not just blowing smoke. I think that's that's my honest opinion on it. So there are some upcoming tournaments that plan to allow fans, but that decision is, you know, still up in the air as far as USGA championships go. How will the broadcast be different if there are no fans at the U.S. Open? When you when you think about it, I, I would dare say that Augusta is one of the only spots where the crowd is is really part of the telecast because you can hear the roars echoing through the pine trees and so on and so forth. Whereas the the other ones, and I'm not trying to minimize the the impact that a crowd has, but I just don't think that in a golf telecast you're trying to to bring that to the forefront of the broadcast. If it happens to happen, great. And if not, you know, the the story is still just the golf and it's and it's such a wide expanse that you're trying to cover. I know I'm skirting the question a little bit, but to be honest with you, I haven't thought about it from a golf perspective because I think it's it's much more impactful in other sports. No, I understand that. And you know, you mentioned the college football and golf. What are some of the differences for you between calling college football and golf? I mean, how much time you got? They are, they are opposite. I like the coin, um, certainly. Um, I think that when, when, when I think about a, a college football broadcast, I, I think of a sprint. And, and I think of as, as high of an emotional ride as you could possibly take for three and a half hours. And you know, what I'm trying to do is in the booth to the best of my ability is stay out of the way of the action, bring great stories to the forefront. Um, and then this other piece, which is like unlock what's going on, almost like a Rubik's cube from a technical standpoint and a schematic standpoint to try to bring the viewer a little bit closer to the action so that they can try to anticipate what's going to happen next. And, and that's really what I see my, my role as. And as, as well as just, you know, creating a sound with Gus that has rhythm, that has um, good pace to it, that is easy on the ears and yet exciting for you to hear uh, when you're at home. On a golf telecast, it's almost the exact opposite. It is an absolute marathon, and you try not to get uh, emotionally involved in what's going on because you know it's going to be such a long championship. And my role is so different. You know, so what I'm doing uh, more than anything is just watching, and I'm trying to take notes about where's the turning point in, in a specific player's round that we might talk to. Uh, do I see some body language on the course that I want to ask him about? Uh, so it's it's much more like an investigative reporter versus, uh, you know, in college football, it's kind of like a roller coaster. It's like you hold on and you hold on tight. You try not to screw it up, and you try to bring some level of insight uh, when you can. Yeah, when you're not on the air and you're traveling uh, throughout that college football season, are you taking your sticks on the road? You know, obviously there's a lot of prep that goes into the broadcast, but, you know, golfers always find time. I know that. They do, and, and I'm not one of them, unfortunately. It's just – it's too big of an undertaking. You know, the information for a for – a, uh, you know, an A-level college football broadcast, a top-level college football broadcast is is so vast. And to be honest, I just think it would do the game uh, a disservice. And more so, I think it would do my teammates, you know, Gus, all of our crew, uh, our wonderful people in the truck, Chuck McDonald, our producer, Rich Dewey, our director. I feel like it would be a disservice to them if, if I wasn't completely all in by the time uh, that I got to uh, the site. 
Now, on Tuesday morning, that's a different story, and I'll try to sneak away and, and get a, you know, that's kind of my goal is to at least hit balls once a week on like a Tuesday morning for a couple of hours, and if I can get nine holes in, that's great. And then as soon as college football is over, it's, uh, it's go time. It's golf season, as I like to put it. Yeah, that's right. And I, I completely understand, obviously, but uh, doing my job here, obviously had to ask. So yeah. on that on that topic, uh, on, and honestly, this is one of my favorite questions to ask these days because I've been taking intense notes for years, but what is your favorite college football town? I know you've been oh, to a lot of them, and I'm sure there's I, a few on your list. There are a lot, and I I would want to – give you a lot of them. Now, you have to understand that for me, when we go into these towns, a lot of what the vibe is surrounds the magnitude of the game that we're about to cover, right? So when we get there by Thursday night, and in particular Friday morning, if it's a massive game, it's already buzzing, right? So it doesn't matter where the, the, the town is, like it's fantastic. More than anything, outside of the town, it's more about, like, the restaurant and, and the ice cream joints because I love ice cream. So, for me, it's like a good Friday night ice cream after all my work is done is, is, is really good. So, there's this place, maybe my favorite spot. There's this place in Ann Arbor, um, and I believe it's called Marble Slab. I could be butchering it. I just know where it's at. But, anyway, there's this amazing ice cream joint in Ann Arbor. Um, that, that I go to and they make the fresh waffle cones. So that, I think that's my favorite thing in the fall is getting to Ann Arbor and going to that ice cream joint. Uh, outside of that, I, I would have to go to the venues, right? So when I get to do, then there's two of them. When I get to do the Red River game, and I know it's not on a college campus, but when I get to do the Red River game in the state, uh, at the State Fair of Texas, and then when I do the game versus Michigan or Ohio State, either venue, those are my absolute favorites. If you're a college football fan, and again, I know it's not on the campus, go to the Red River game. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, game to go to, scene outside of it. And then that Michigan-Ohio State game is obviously amazing as well. I feel like I'm leaving a lot out. Like Madison is great. I love going to Iowa. Um, maybe the only place I don't love going and it's just from the fact that I grew up not liking them is Nebraska. Those are those are all fair, and you know we're we're just looking for uh, an honest answer there, and I think you gave it, so appreciate that. And uh, you know we'll leave you with this. We mentioned it before. You're a very active SCGA member. Uh, last time we talked, you were a, a two handicap, and since you shaved four strokes off, and you find yourself in that rare plus index territory right now, very dangerous. Um, do you have any golf goals for the next few years? And Will we see you out at some SCGA or USGA qualifiers in the future? You're certainly well, good was, enough. Yeah, I was I was signed up this year. It was my goal this year. I was signed up for the U.S. Open qualifier, the U.S. Amateur. There was a couple of SCGA uh, events, the Mid-Am, that I was planning um, on playing. But obviously, with, with the, the events of, of this year, that was all kind of put on hold. Um, so that's my goal is I want to play more competitive golf and, and just see. I don't, you know. I think it would be silly of me to say, oh, I want to do X, Y, or Z as it relates to accomplishing anything in golf because I just haven't played a lot of competitive golf, so I don't know what it feels like. Uh, but I definitely want to go test it out. Um, and and part of that, I guess if I was going to just put something in the ground, okay, like I would love someday to catch a heater and get out of local qualifying for the U.S. Open and go play in sectionals, right? Like that would be that would be phenomenal. Don't tell yourself short. I was looking through that score file today, and there are some low numbers there. So I think uh, if you keep it up, we'll be rooting for you. We'll, and we'll see you out there. So uh, keep it up. I would love to go play in Tahoe, too. Now, that would be fun. That'd be sweet. That'd be sweet. Maybe challenge Tony Romo. That's right. So, Joel, I think that's it for this session of uh, Quarantine Chronicles. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, yeah, man. All, the, all the best to you. Stay safe, and we'll uh, we'll see you out there at a USGA and SCGA event soon. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me on. You too. Take care.